Hey everyone, my name is Shanice and welcome back to my channel. Today I will be reviewing all of the books that I read in February. Last month I read a total of nine books, which is a little bit of a jump from the total number I read in January, which is always a nice thing. So I will begin by showing you the stack. You can already see that at least five of those books were graphic novels which is definitely a main reason why I was able to read nine books the past month. And in reviewing them, I'm going to do what I did in January and go from my least favorite to my most favorite. So to begin, unfortunately, my least favorite of the month is Heartstopper Volume 4. Um, this one I kind of reviewed a little bit in my Heartstopper graphic novels versus TV show video, which I will link above. For me, this felt like the most half-baked of the five volumes that are out right now. Um, here we explore Charlie's eating disorder. Um, so, you know, content warning for anybody who would be sensitive to a topic like that. And I just felt like there was not much developed in terms of how Osman handled this in this book. Um, I think it deserved more time and could have been introduced a lot earlier in the series. Um, it kind of came out of nowhere in the previous volume and then was the main topic in this volume. I also felt like there was some backstory points that also sort of came out of nowhere that were never hinted at or mentioned previous to this volume. So yeah, it was just a mismatch between the heaviness of the topic and the execution. Um, but I still, you know, liked it enough that I continued with volume five. But of the Heartstopper series, this is just not my favorite. Then I gave three stars to a very odd book. It is called Bear. It's by Marion Engel. This is a Canadian modern classic and, you know, it's very short. I do love this cover. Essentially, it is about this woman named Lou who goes to this remote island in Canada. Um, this island has been passed down by this one family um, and they keep a huge library. And so Lou is invited to go to this island to keep an inventory of all the library materials. She seems to be a researcher of some sort. And on this island, there are very few people. She has like one neighbor named Homer who kind of starts flirting with her and she might flirt back occasionally because there's not much to do. Um, and also there's a big bear in her backyard or like in the woods near where she's living. Um, and a relationship ensues between the bear and Lou. Um, it's not really a metaphor. Things actually do happen. So I gave this three stars because I have to commend anyone who commits themselves to writing something like this. The voice was really assertive. The writing was actually very compact and at times beautiful to read. Um, some of the work that is described that Lou does is very boring so I will say for a few pages here I couldn't care less about reading about bears um, or like perusing any of the information that Lou was finding in the books in that library in the house that she's staying in. Um, didn't really interest me that much. The centerpiece here is obviously the obsession with the bear um, and you start learning that it might not just be Lou who has this connection with the bear. There might have been others before her who also feel an attraction to the bear. Um, and there is, you know, a bit of metaphor and symbolism going on here. You know, what is the book really trying to say about man's need to overtake nature to make themselves at home in a place that isn't theirs is doing something as unnatural as being with a bear the only way that they can truly become one with nature which in essence does it say that humans relationship to nature is distant now um should it actually stay that way it's also looking at i think colonialism too if it's not naturally yours should you unnaturally take it which again kind of matches what Lou was doing with the bear. <laughs> so yeah, it was just so odd and bold and like nothing I've ever read before. So it 
it's definitely going to stay with me and I want to pick it apart a little bit more, spend some time thinking about what it's trying to do and what it's trying to say. Um, but it's it's a unique one for sure. And Marian Engel didn't write that much. I think she has maybe two or three other novels um, and they're equally about obsession and like weird. So I'm curious to just read a little bit more from Engel because this is one that I will not forget. I also gave three stars to Heartstopper Volumes 1 and Volume 2. These are truly addictive. I couldn't put them down. I finished each volume in the series within an hour, at most an hour and a half. Yes, it's very cute. It's feel good. It's kind of saccharine at some points. We all need that at some moments in our lives and it just happened to be the moment in my life where I needed it. So really had a good time. I can't say that they're the most amazing graphic novels I've ever read in my life, but they did what they came to do and I had a fun time. So three stars to both of these volumes. And then as for Heartstopper volumes three and five, I give three and a half stars. These are I think truly where Oseman is able to investigate one topic or one question or one issue and sustain it throughout the whole length of the volume. Volume 5 really explores the characters discovering where they want to go to university and handling how they might have to get into long distance relationships. Volume 3 is mainly centered in Paris, which, you know, is a stereotypical romantic setting. And it's just, it was so lovely. I liked the honest depictions of Paris, the drawings of the Eiffel Tower. You know, you could tell that Osman has been to Paris um, with the Eiffel Tower. You know, they took the stairs just to the second level and, you know, you can take the elevator there and then pay more to go to the very top. The class didn't pay for those tickets to go to the very top or for the um, elevator. Very relatable and the Louvre was represented very well and just the streets of Paris. There was an authenticity to this one that I really appreciated it and again they're just so unputdownable. I just want volume six right now. And just look how cute the characters are. This was adorable. Simply adorable. So three and a half stars for volumes three and five. Then I did manage to read one poetry collection. Um, it's called The Carrying by Ada Limon and she is a poet laureate of the United States. This collection has a lot of themes of hoping and just how we all have to manage to get through the BS of life. Um, it looks at the the way that the cycle of life and death moves. It looks at the theme of nature and how that unites all of us in our struggle. Um, it's a more personal look, of course, here for Limon. She does talk about her father's Alzheimer's um, as well as her stepmother's death and also her struggle with infertility and just the weight of daily life and the weight of ancestral history of pain, of struggle. Um, so it is a heavy collection, but gorgeous language. I'm not the most equipped to analyze poetry, but I always want to give it a try. And this was not a letdown. Some of my favorite poems were The Leash, Trying, The Raincoat, A New National Anthem, Notes on the Below, there are a few others as well, but the whole collection is pretty stunning. Um, and I ended up giving it three and a half stars. And I will say, because sometimes literature inevitably makes me think of music, um, I think a good song to represent what this collection stands for or what it's exploring is Hope is a Dangerous Thing for a Woman Like Me to Have by Lana Del Rey. I think it just, it perfectly captures what Limon was exploring and writing about in this collection. And then I gave four stars to a reread and also my Latin American book challenge pick for the months of January and February. I will link my full 2024 TBR list for my Reading Through Latin America series up above, but 
the first pick of the year was Cien Años de Soledad by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. In a way this is like a biblical story. It's epic in scope. It follows the Buendia family from the founding of a town called Macondo to essentially the end of the line of the Buendia family and you really follow everyone. I said in the beginning, um, I think in January when I was doing my wrap up that, oh, I wasn't having really a problem with keeping up with the names, um, even through all the repetition. Well, come February, I definitely struggled. So I actually just printed out the family tree and used that to remember who is who um, because it does become a challenge at some point it really does this book is about so many things um it certainly is about the cycle of time the repetition of time but also of just living in the present um it's about how it can be good to know your history to know your past but also how detrimental that can be if it turns into an obsession um it's also about how introducing things like politics and religion and law are just tools for corruption um that they cause temptation in people um, and lead people to destroy their own lives and in turn society in an unsalvageable way unless we confront the mistakes of the past we are doomed <laughs> and for the most part people here unknowingly can't avoid the mistakes of their predecessors because there's such repetition and there's such an echo of the things past in the present. It's almost like people can't escape it. It's their fate. The way that incest was used here really reminded me of the way that it was kind of used in The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy. Really it's about like the preservation of nationhood or city or clan, you know, it's, it's almost a way to preserve what you like about your group of your community. It's remarkable how the whole story flows. None of the chapters are numbered. Time is a continuous cyclical thing. Life is just one story. The history of the earth is just one story. Um, our lives are just fragments of it, um, but not the whole thing. Like we all live in different worlds. I think the chapters reflect that also, but it's just, it's really masterful. I, I have no idea how Marquez was able to just keep up with everything and it truly does just flow. It's not stream of consciousness but it moves and its rhythm is it's almost just spewing out of the pages. You know it's something truly unique. It has its own language and imagination and vision and characters and worlds. I'm so glad I reread this and I gave it four stars. I didn't give it five stars simply because, you know, the confusion did put me in a bit of a daze <laughs> with the names, sometimes with the story itself, having to turn back the pages. You know, there's, there's a bit of labor to getting through this. I don't think this is a book that you just pick up and read non-stop like the Heartstopper series obviously. Definitely requires concentration um, but I think it's so worth taking a look at and analyzing and enjoying. Um, take your time with it if you do pick it up and yeah it was a, a fabulous way to start the new year. And then lastly the book that I gave four and a half stars to, my favorite book of the month, and my big book challenge for the month of February. I am so glad I finally picked this up um, because I loved it so much. And that was The Makioka Sisters by Junichiro Tanizaki. Now I can more properly summarize this book. Um, it does follow the four Makioka sisters. You have Suruku, she is the eldest, then you have Sachiko, and then you have Yukiko and Taiko. Suruko and Sachiko are both married. Um, Suruko has I think three children and in the book early on 
her family moves to Tokyo um, from the more provincial towns of Osaka to Tokyo, which is a big shift for the family. Um, Sachiko, she still lives around Osaka and her and her husband, Tenosuke, they are both tasked with finding a suitable husband for Yukiko, who at the start of the book is around 33 years old. It's very looked down upon in Japanese society at the time, um, the time being like the 1930s, like right before the start of World War II. Um, it was very looked down upon for a woman to be like older than 25 and unmarried. So they are desperate to find Yukiko a match. Um, she's very, very shy and reserved. Um, and I guess some people think she's weird, but really what she is is a woman who knows what she wants and she's not just gonna settle for somebody because society tells her that she has to be married. Um, she has agreed to be married for her family's sake, but she's not just gonna pick anybody. And it's caused a bit of trouble aside from the obvious, being a 33 year old woman who is unmarried, but it is a problem because Taiko, who is the youngest child, already has somebody who wants to marry her, but she can't marry him because it would be seen as very taboo for the youngest to be married before all of the older sisters are married. So the Makioka sisters, um, their father died and their father and their family kind of represent a very traditional Japan. Um, they have their strict rules, their regimented society life. Um, they are wealthy or they were wealthy. They're kind of fading away from the wealth. And also they are kind of distant from the more progressive Japan that surrounds them. Um, it's a Japan that's very much influenced by Western culture, specifically US culture. Um, there are German immigrants, there are Russian immigrants in Japan, they are neighbors to some of the Makioka sisters. The younger generations then have more of an opportunity to meet people of different backgrounds. Um, you also notice I said Germany and Russia. So as I mentioned, it is taking place the years preceding World War II. So Tanizaki is obviously trying to do something by putting a German character in here. I loved every second of this. I wouldn't say it's a page turner, but it has this subtle comedy, like this very sophisticated sense of humor that prevails on every page. I loved it. I loved all of the characters. They all came to life to me. My, I just have a soft spot for Yukiko, maybe because I'm shy and a bit reserved. I get the judgment that people might have on someone like that. Um, and also she's pretty independent and has severe social anxiety. Like she hates going on the phone. I can relate. Hates meeting new people or being forced to do things socially that she doesn't want to completely relate to that. Her sister Taiko is the more free-spirited, like extroverted sister. Um, she's a little rebellious. She breaks the rules a bit. Um, she's the one who wears Western clothing the most, um, whereas Yukiko is, I guess, the most traditionally Japanese looking. That's how she's described in the book. And yeah, Tanizaki just fleshed every single person out. Tanizaki brings the humanity back to war. Um, the war isn't actually taking place in the book. Um, it actually ends right before the war, but there are character decisions and, you know, moments where you know what is in store for some people. Like one of the characters here moves to the United States and you can't help thinking about how the U.S. treated Japanese Americans or just Japanese people in the U.S. during World War II. So you kind of know, unfortunately, what is in store for that person. Um, same for the ones going to Germany. Or you know there's going to be some strain between the German characters, the German family in here, and the main Makioka family. It also just makes you look at how unfair the matchmaking system was. You know, people were disqualified because someone in their family had 
either a physical disability or some other disability, like a learning disability or something, that would be disqualified immediately. And it just goes to show how discriminatory those practices were and still are in some places. But I truly never wanted this book to end. Um, I do think it ended really abruptly. <laughs> you know, Yukiko's story is sort of closed and then she just has diarrhea and that's it. <laughs> and I'm not joking that like she literally has diarrhea on a train and that's the end of the book. And that is in line with the kind of sense of humor of this book, but it's frustrating as an ending. Um, I wanted a little bit more of a nice bow at the end, but of course it's Japan right before World War II. Like it wouldn't be realistic to just have a perfect little ending. I did love how Tanizaki didn't hold back from showing the good and the bad in all of these characters. You see a lot of anti-Chinese sentiments from the Makioka family as well as others um, and how the historical context plays into that though not excusing it. So I love this. I love this. If you have never heard of this I would say pick this up. If you like Tolstoy and his sweeping familial stories, I think you would really love this too. I'm telling you, this is really funny. This is truly very, very funny. Um, I gave it four and a half stars. If it weren't for that ending, it might have been a five, but I'm happy with four and a half for it. It's top, top, one of my favorites of the year so far. Um, highly, highly recommend. And I know you're probably thinking, what about Clarice Lispector? I am donning her sweater that I got from the Center for Fiction. Um, the truth is I did not finish. My <laughs> wonderful, uh, complete stories of the fabulous Clarice Lispector, I'm this way through. You can't even see that, can you? I am this way through. I have this much left. I just didn't finish, <laughs> but I will in March. Um, I'm not going to be hard on myself anymore for not finishing a challenge when I said I'm going to finish it. Um, this was my pick for January and February, but whatever. I'm going to finish it in March and it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. <laughs> but that is it. Those are the nine books that I have finished in February. I can't believe it's March already, but I will see you soon for another bookish video and thank you so much for watching. As usual, you know, leave a comment down below, like and subscribe, and I will see you all next week. Bye-bye!